Good afternoon. I am here to talk about MySQL, uh, High Availability, Disaster Recovery, and Load Balancing, the only talk title that will not fit on a single slide. My name is Davey Shafik. If you don't know me, I am a community engineer at EngineYard. Uh, EngineYard will take your apps and scale them in the cloud. Sorry, it's too close to my face. Y'all don't need to hear that. There we go. Um, I am the author of the Zen PHP 5 Certification Study Guide. Uh, PHP Master is my latest book and also PHP Anthology. Uh, I've co-written those with a bunch of great people. Go check them out. Uh, I'm a contributor to Zen Framework 1 and 2, PHP Docs. Um, I've, done, I've got one patch in internals. Uh, I'm the, co uh, the original creator, that's not on the slide, of FAR, uh, EXT FAR. Uh, I originated that technology. And you can find me on Twitter as at dshafik. So if you have any feedback, uh, glad to hear it. Uh, before I get started, I want to also mention I am the lead for PHP Women in the US. We are currently doing a Kickstarter for these, not these, this is a mock-up, uh, of purple elephants. So if you want to get one for yourself, just hit the URL at the bottom, and it'll toss you over to Kickstarter. We'd appreciate your support. Uh, one more thing. Uh, I'm Hard of hearing, where's that piece? There we go. Um, so if you have a question, put your hand up. I will actually come out and uh, get my steps in for the day. Um, everyone forgets it. Uh, about these slides, I do something a little differently to most presenters, uh, other than walk around. Um, I put up a title slide like this, so that y'all don't read what I'm speaking. Uh, but behind it is a bullet slide that I'll skip. Um, there's two things that I really hate is when you can read what I'm saying and it becomes subtitles, which is a deaf guy, that's okay, but like for the rest of y'all is kind of annoying. And then if someone said, there's a great talk, and I go look at the slides and it's 18 cat pictures with random words on. So I try to avoid both of those. So you'll see me skip slides, um, that's why. So first of all, I'm um, gonna define a couple things. Uh, so high availability, um, it's not about servers that don't die. It's just about making sure the service itself is available at all times. And um, that's a really important concept to understand, especially in the cloud where servers are kind of ephemeral. They're going away, coming back. So it's all about service, not server. Disaster recovery. Um, this is the process for recovering from different failure scenarios. Um, they can be automated or not, typically somewhere in between. Uh, and it's all about planning. Uh, you need something to recover from and something to recover to. Uh, a lot of people forget the first one. Um, they don't realize that, hey, I've got a backup server, but nothing to put on it because it's not stored anywhere. And then finally, uh, we'll look at load balancing. Um, so this is about balancing the load between multiple machines. Um, this can be kind of smart, so it's based on like system performance metrics and stuff like that, or kind of dumb, like round robin. Um, an easy option for this is ELBs from Amazon. Uh, they're elastic load balancers, but they're incredibly slow. Um, so HA proxy is my preference. Um, it's really fast and pretty darn easy to set up. So why did I write this talk? Um, mostly because I find my SQL admin to be kind of fun. I'm just a nerd. Um, but my main goal was to make the system predictable so that it can be automated because I don't like to do the same things over and over. Um, and a lot of these concepts, the three things, impact system design kind of up front. Um, the other thing is uh, Percona came out with Percona Cluster and I kind of went ooh shiny and played with it. So uh, that's where this talk came out of. I wrote like a 30-page internal document at Ending Yard to kind of improve our MySQL service, and this talk is kind of the result of that. Um, so we're going to look at um, high availability and performance. Uh, I wanted minimal code impact, so I wanted a drop-in system. That was what excited me about Percona Cluster, and I wanted it to be fairly simple, um, so less moving parts. Uh, the more parts you have to any system, the more points of failure you have. So those are my three goals, is performance uh, with high availability, minimal code changes, and simple. So I'm going to start off by looking at uh, a MySQL 5.5 um, solution. 
And with MySQL 5.5, they implemented a new feature called semi-synchronous replication. And what semi-synchronous replication allows you to do is to selectively denote that slaves require, uh, or rather that the master requires that slave to acknowledge that it has received the data before it can hand off on the right back to the original uh, query. Um, what this does is it gives you improved data integrity. Uh, the master blocks until at least one of those semi-synchronous slaves, not all, but one has acknowledged it. Um, it's a little bit slower because of that, because it has to wait for the next server in line to say that it's got it. Um, but it also fails over to a synchronous replication with a timeout. So you can kind of manage how much slower you're willing to go before you sacrifice the um, data integrity. So this is what uh, my system looks like. I know it looks kind of complicated, but it's really not. Um, so we have our application layer up the top. Um, I'm using an elastic IP so that I can switch between my master and what will become my master in my failover scenario. Um, and we're using Heartbeat, which is a simple piece of software that checks when things are up and makes things happen when that goes away. In addition to that, we have three slaves that are behind a simple load balancer that are just for reads only. Um, so all of our writes go to our master. Um, and so what happens here is uh, our master has synchronous replication set up with just a single slave. And the reason I did that is that because semi-synchronous replication says one out of all the ones you set to be semi-synchronous has to acknowledge it, there's no guarantees of which one that is. It's just that something else in your cluster has it. So by marking only one as semi-synchronous, you can say this slave is going to be the most current, most up-to-date version of my data that's possible to have in my cluster. So what that's telling you is this is where you're going to fail over from or to, both in this case. Um, so it just designates one slave as if things go wrong, that's where I'm turning to. Uh, what it avoids is uh, split brain, which is where part of your cluster has some information, some has others, um, and you need to kind of merge them back together. You can say this one here is the one that I want. Benefit of that is you can automate it because you know the answer to where you're going to go to. Um, we still use our standard asynchronous replication on the other slaves, and they act as normal. What will happen then, you know, uh, what will happen is in a, a failure scenario is you'll flip over to your primary slave, you'll hook up your regular slaves back up to that one now, and then they'll sink down um, and fix up. So setting up semi-sync is really easy. Um, you just do install plugin, and then the name of the plugin on the master um, which is this semi-sync master.so. Um, this is a, a SQL uh, command you run. Uh, and then you set these two settings in your MySQL configuration. Um, so the first one is whether it's enabled, and the second one is the timeout. That timeout is how you manage that. How long am I willing to wait to make sure I get data integrity? And it is in seconds, so there's a minimum of one. Um, but it's reasonable. For the slave, it's even, yes. Yes. No. So the master, yes, until the until the timeout happens, the master will not finish that right. So if you do an insert, that um, so you do an insert onto the master, the master will not acknowledge to the client your PHP script that it has completed that until one semi-sync slave has said I've got it or the timeout happens. Um, so all the other writes can continue. It's that one particular write that gets stalled. Any other questions? So on the slave, oops, on the slave, it's even simpler. Um, we just do install plugin again, except this time it's the semi-sync slave um, plugin, and we just turn on slave enabled, um, and that actually informs the master that this is a semi-sync slave. Um, so it's super easy to set up. So disaster recovery, um, I've covered a little bit of this. So your primary slave is your predetermined failover master. Um, this will have the most up-to-date content, but not necessarily all of the content. So what that means is, is if there was something in process that hadn't been received on the master yet, or from the master, it's lost. But at least you know everything on that slave is good. 
um, and as up to date as it can be. If you've lost the data in transmission, it's lost, right? But you're minimizing that risk. Um, so all of your slaves must reconnect to the new master. So simply you do a change master, which we'll get into a little bit, um, and with the correct new position from your new semi, uh, from your old semi sync slave. Uh, and then you switch the app over. So in my case, I would just switch the ELB, uh, the Elastic IP, sorry, over. The app will be none the wiser. Performance for this setup. Um, so I did some benchmarks. Uh, I used one, uh, so it's all done in AWS. So before I go into this, all of this is done in AWS. And as with any benchmarks, but particularly on AWS, this is more about relative performance and kind of to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, but it is important to see, and especially when we get to Percona cluster. Um, so what I used was one extra large AWS instance um, for our benchmarker. So we didn't want the benchmarker to be CPU bound running the benchmarks. Right? So make that super big. Uh, our master is a medium, one medium, and then we had three large instances for the slaves, one of which was set to semi-sync. Common question I get at this point is why the heck are your slaves bigger than your master? And most people go, well, we're going to have multiple slaves. They can be kind of you know, crappy machines and whatever. What you have to understand is every single write that happens on your master has to also happen on the slaves, and it has to service the reads. Your slave should be bigger than your master. Um, and then we had, had HA proxy sitting in front of the slaves uh, on one large instance again. Way overkill, but I wanted to make sure that it wasn't impact in the benchmark negatively negatively by being CPU bound or memory bound. Yeah, HA proxy is just a load balancing software. Um, so I used uh, SysBench, uh, the OLTP benchmark, which stands for Online Transaction Processing. Um, and it's kind of a synthetic benchmark that runs a whole bunch of different types of queries. Um, that you would see commonly with like uh, transactional websites. Um, so you'll do an insert, you'll do a select with a range, um, updates with limits. So, so it's a whole kind of, it's not just like one query over and over and over, this kind of a stupid query that you would run for benchmark. It's kind of um, more realistic. So I inserted one and a half million rows. Uh, I used 64 connections, which is kind of low uh, for a production environment, but I wanted it to be consistent. Um, InnoDB, because I like InnoDB and my ISAM sucks. 50,000 queries, and you can optionally set read only uh, if, you don't, if you just want to test like your slave performance. So the one and a half million records with indexes took a minute and 13 seconds, including getting replicated out to all of our slaves. Um, so we made sure that everything was completed. Um, that went to, obviously, the one master and then replicated out, so it's one thread. Then we ran the OLTP benchmark uh, itself. So for read writes with the semi-sync enabled, we get 2,850 queries per second, which is really respectable. Um, without the semi-synchronous enabled, we got 2,900. So we're not talking about a huge performance loss here. Uh, read only, we got 10,850 queries per second. So reads are super, super fast. And let's face it, most of our apps are pretty read heavy, right? So we just one medium and four larges were able to handle almost 11,000 queries per second. Yes. Hang on. Say that again. I'm asking if all those machines were in the same availability zone. Yes, they're all in the same availability zone um, and in the same, yeah, availability zone, uh, in the same region. I do get to some global distribution stuff. Um, actually, I, I should mention that here. So what's really cool with the semi-synchronous stuff is um, because it, if you wanted to do like global distribution, global failover, you could have a secondary semi-sync server anywhere in the world. And what will happen is the master will write to the first semi-sync, get its acknowledgment, and it doesn't then wait for the further one to acknowledge. So it hands off immediately. So your latency doesn't get impacted by that server that's halfway across the world. Um, so doing the second hop uh, can allow you to have distributed uh, failover without the latency issues, yes. No, 
It doesn't impact the master. It doesn't wait for the second hop. Okay, so the, the, what happens is is the um, the primary slave does not. It only says that it's got the data, not that it's written it to disk. And the handoff is really fast. Um, it doesn't wait for its primary slave to replicate before handing back. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, any questions on five five before we move on? Um, so I originally gave this talk with a good friend of mine. In fact, the best man at my wedding, Lagaya Termel. And uh, we were writing the slide, and she said, oh, by the way, have you heard about the new stuff in 5.6? And I went, no. She goes, okay, it's important, and this is why. So they added global transaction IDs, GTIDs. These are a unique identifier across all servers, uh, across all the bin logs. Um, and it basically combines the UUID and the transaction ID. So transaction-based, uh, you can read this. Yeah, we go back so you can. Um, <laughs> Uh, so there's no need uh, for log files or positions when you do a change masters. Anyone set up replication with MySQL before? You have to stop your master, check your log position in the log file, then you can restart it again and change the slave to point to the exact point, right? Um, with GTIDs, you don't have to do that anymore. It's actually possible to automate it, and it's just set it to auto, and it'll go and figure it out itself. It's fantastic. Um, while, the, while the master's still running. Uh, it's consistent group-wide. Um, I don't use the word uh, cluster because MySQL cluster is a thing, right? Um, and it has easier failover because of this, uh, because it can automate the stuff. So this is what GTID looks like, or our setup looks like with GTID. It's vastly simpler because we don't have the whole semi-sync versus um, regular sync anymore. Though you could combine the two, there's not really any need. Um, so all of our writes go to our master. All of our reads go to the load balancer. We're using asynchronous replication, three slaves again. Um, that would be HA proxy. And then we have this new tool that is available called MySQL failover. And I have a link to that at the end. And basically, it does monitoring, and then it handles your failover scenario. Um, so setting up both uh, master and slave, you do GTID mode equals on. This is all in your MySQL My config. So this is the same for both. Um, log bin, which is standard uh, replication stuff. Uh, enforce GTID consistency equals on and log slave updates. And then on the slave, all you have to do is stop slave, change master to master host, user password. And then we have this master auto position equals one. That's the magic for GTIDs to work so that you don't need to stop the master um, and check for the position and file. Uh, and then you start the slave. So if you're bringing a new server into play, you do this and it'll just connect up. Any questions so far? So uh, disaster recovery on this um, is basically that MySQL failover tool. Uh, so it performs replication health monitoring um, and will handle automatic failover. Now one thing that's really important to understand is that while it's automatic, it's not immediate. Uh, there is sort of a interval in seconds that it'll check, so it doesn't kill your server checking for its health. Um, and it has to be more than five seconds, or sorry, more than or equal to five seconds. Um, but what it does is it has a whole bunch of hook scripts that it can run that kind of, um, first of all, uh, well, the hook scripts are here. Um, the first one is that it failed to check. So maybe you alert somebody uh, and then set the app to maintenance mode. Uh, maybe you have a, the ability to flip a switch in your app's configuration so that you can tell your visitors, hey, we're in maintenance mode, sorry. Uh, if you ever use Reddit, you know Reddit is down. That's what I'm talking about. Um, then before it does any actual failover stuff, it'll run another hook script. This allows you to uh, say you want to log something or try to take a backup um, and alert somebody. Then. Uh, there's an after failure, uh, so you're going to alert somebody, because what are you going to do? It's, it's kind of failed over. It's done that bit. Uh, and then finally, there's this after complete recovery. And this is kind of where you get important again. Um, so you modify your application config. Maybe you're going to change your master server IP address uh, or host name. Um, you turn off your uh, uh, maintenance mode. Uh, maybe you switch over your Elastic IPs. 
but also you have the chance to verify your application's up and running, right? Run a test, hit the site, make sure it's there. Uh, and of course, tell somebody. What's awesome with this is you get a text message on your phone, crap, everything's down. Wait, something's happening. Okay, we're recovered. Oh, and it's all good. And you didn't even have to get out of bed, right? So this allows you to automate a whole bunch of stuff. So performance-wise, uh, we're going to use the exact same um, set of stuff. So one AWS extra large for the benchmarker, one medium, three larges, and an extra large for HA proxy. The one and a half million records took 60 seconds to replicate, so it's. Let me go back and just see exactly what that number was. Hmm? Yeah, so 13 seconds difference. Thank you. Somebody's paying attention. Um, but again, it's a single thread. Uh, it's not really a good benchmark to know about, but it's, it's handy to have there. Um, on the other hand, our sysbench stuff, um, obviously there's no semi-sync turnoff, uh, so there's only one read-write. 2950, uh, 50 queries per second more than the non-semi-sync um, version before. This is mainly due to MySQL 5.6 performance increases in general. Um, our read only goes down a little bit, but probably not. It's kind of a statistical nothing. Um, so the performance on this is pretty good. Any questions on 5.6? So 5.6, the GTID stuff, um, is the most exciting thing in this talk, I think. Uh, 5.7, uh, and maybe you can correct me on this, uh, they're looking at GTIDs for potential master-master replication type stuff, um, or getting towards that. Um, so 5.7 is doing more with GTIDs, but that's not in this talk. So let's get to the reason I started the talk, which is Vacona ExtraDB cluster. And I've kind of given away the game here, but um, it's multi-master replication. So it's kind of the holy grail of stick all of your servers behind a load balancer, and it doesn't matter which one you hit, because you can write anything to anywhere, and it'll be everywhere. Um, it's drop-in. It's kind of like Amazon RDS, but doesn't suck, or that's the theory. Um, it uses the ExtraDB table engine, um, which is InnoDB compatible. It doesn't use NDB, which is what MySQL cluster uses, um, which I'm not a big fan of NDB. It has some drawbacks that it's not like drop in, in my opinion. Um, so basically, it's supposed to automatically transfer state to newly introduced machines. So you can bring up a blank server running for Kona cluster, and it'll replicate everything over and say, I'm ready for service and start handling requests. Um, it still has one primary server, though, and that's kind of the one that manages the communication in the cluster, so you have to be aware of that. If it fails, you kind of have to make something else the primary, but that's kind of all you're managing there. Um, and it's based on Galera, which is an open source deal uh, for multi-master writes. Um, but instead of using Galera defaults to rsync to transfer state, they use um, their version of InnoDB hot backup, which is extra DB backup. Um, so it's sort of a uh, more compressed and uh, faster differential engine to just pass just the different changes over. Um, so this is what this looks like. We're getting really simple here. We're, like I said, this is the holy grail of drop-in clustered scalable awesomeness for MySQL. So all our reads and writes go into a load balancer and hitting all the servers behind it. Setup is a little complicated. Um, the primary server setup, so this is again your, your my uh, comp. Um, WS rep cluster address, gcom colon slash slash. That's how you designate this as your primary server. And then pretty much everything else is fairly standard. Um, this is the uh, provider. So this is the Galera stuff that does the multi-master. We have two slave threads so that we're using two threads to do our um, replication. That's going to be kind of based on how many servers you have. Uh, in our case, we only have three. Two is OK. Um, I called it benchmarking as my cluster name. That can be anything you want. This SST method, this is the state transfer method. So you can use rsync. You can use like tar. I think it's in tar balls around. Um, or you can use uh, extra backup. And then you can set a name. Um, on the all the other servers, it's basically identical, except that you put in the IP address in that URL at the top of the primary server. Um, so what will happen is all your other servers will connect to the primary and say, hey, what else is out there? So disaster recovery becomes really simple. 
Uh, you choose a new primary server, you update your configuration, and you restart all your servers. That's totally scriptable, right? That's super easy. Performance-wise uh, is where we run into issues. Um, I was unable to test it reliably. Uh, more than four concurrent connections users um, basically resulted in primary key collisions across the cluster. Um, what that meant was is if I tried to insert data, it would generate a primary key, try to replicate it out, and fail. Um, that's at four users. That was fairly common. Um, once I got up to 16 threads, I could never finish the benchmark. And I have never run an app with fewer than 500 active connections. So 16 is not, not workable. Um, what this looks like is this error down at the bottom. Uh, failed to execute duplicate entry for my primary key. Done. The fatal errors from the sysbench. Um, I actually took this to the Verkana guys. I'm like, this doesn't seem right. Like, 16 connections is abysmal. Like, how do you, how do you manage that? And so what they explained to me is this is correct behavior. Uh, the reasoning for it is that server-wide, so on an individual server, they're very pessimistic about what keys are going to be available when generating a new key. But they're optimistic about it cluster-wide. So what will happen is, is you'll get a valid key on the local server, try to replicate out to the cluster, and something else has already taken it. Their solution to that is to just retry the query until it succeeds. So now I'm like, OK. I could do that, especially if I'm using like an ORM or something. I can build that in fairly easily. But I want to drop in. I don't want to modify my code. And at some point, you're going to retry 10, 15 times and be like, I'm done. I'm out of here. I can't do this, right? For me, this is not a scalable uh, thing. Now, to be fair, I started trying it in the beta. So I'm like, OK, I made it to beta, whatever. But then I talked to them and I'm like, this is how it's supposed to be. And I've been following along. It hasn't gotten any better. Uh, there are other issues. Um, the replication itself was very brittle. Um, and I would, because I'm in AWS and doing all these benchmarks, sometimes just restarting the daemon would completely break replication. It would no longer bring in new state. Um, restoring the server, uh, sorry, restarting the server, however, almost always broke it. Um, so restarting the daemon sometimes broke it. Restarting the server almost always broke it. Uh, adding new nodes very often failed. I ended up having to do the old do a dump and import it which is kind of pointless. That's another thing that we don't want to have to deal with. Um, and I was completely unable to get the system up and running with the latest version for this talk. It just wouldn't run. Um, wouldn't replicate. Any questions about that? Which what? Um, everything should end up everywhere. That's the idea. Right. It, you still have to do things like sharding. This is more about scaling for performance, not about scaling to store your data. Um, so the last thing I want to look at is read-write splitting. Um, what am I doing for time? Ooh, I've got plenty of time for questions. hope we have a lot. Um, so uh, has anyone looked at my SQLND? Anyone using it? Any, everyone? OK, so with PHP 5.3, um, they included a new uh, replacement for libMySQL called MySQL ND. And ND stands for native driver. And basically what it is is a libMySQL that's part of PHP itself. It's still an extension, but it's built directly like a regular extension in PHP. It's not wrapping a library. Um, what that gives you is. Things like memory usage get way better because before libMySQL would run the query for you. You ask it to run the query, it would get the result set and buffer it, and then hand it over to PHP, which would buffer it. Um, and so it used more memory. By MySQL ND um, is much better on that. I'd love some water. But oh well. um, what's really cool, though, is MySQL ND has the ability to have plugins. And one of those is MySQL ND underscore MS. And MS stands for master slave. Um, it's super simple to install. Just a Peckle extension. Everyone use Peckle? Um, so Peckle install MySQL ND MS. In your PHP config, you enable it and set a configuration file. You are amazing.
and uh, the configuration file is a JSON uh, file. So looking at that, you define an application. It's just a, a JSON structure. You set your master. Now, this is built around the idea that you can have multiple masters, but typically you wouldn't um, unless you're into something like my, uh, sorry, Bacona cluster and it actually works. Um, you set your host or your socket, and then you set up your slaves. This is kind of where you would set up multiple slaves, slave zero, slave one, slave two. Um, and what that does is allow you to actually do uh, sort of basic load balancing without actually needing a load balancer. Um, so that's one less moving part. As far as actually splitting, I hate this slide. Um, as far as actually splitting, um, the way that it works is if the query starts with select, it will use the slave. Pretty simple. Uh, however, um, there were these specific comments. These are SQL comments. Um, so MySQL ND underscore MS slave switch will force it to use the slave. That would allow you to write to the slave, so be careful. Um, the same one for master switch. Um, so for example, uh, oh, this one's important. This one here, it's two queries put together with a semicolon in the middle, a select and then an insert. It's dumb. It'll see the select, go, oh, it's a select, and send it to the slave. Careful with that one. It's hard, also hard to run that type of query, but um, it's there. If, for example, you know that there's a query that's following a write, and you need to ensure that you're not hit by replication lag, you can force your selects to the master, is in the master switch, or there's this switch here, which is last used, which will basically use whatever was last used, right? So if you're not sure if the query is going to be following a write, um, then use that one. And if it has followed the write conditionally, then it'll switch it automatically to pull from the master. So I got a whole bunch of resources. Um, Semi-synchronous replication documentation, GTID documentation. MySQL utilities, this is where the MySQL failover utility lives. Um, and then the Percona Extra DB cluster. Uh, you don't need to care about those links, care about the one at the bottom. This link right here will contain all the others. Um, so EYIO SSP 14 MySQL. If you have any feedback, that's not the correct joined in link because that's what I was meant to do over lunch. So ignore that. Um, however, at DShafik on Twitter, davidengineer.com. The slides will be available at davyshafik.com slash slides. And again, the resources are available. I will go ahead and put the correct joined in link uh, at that um, SSPHP 14 MySQL thing. So that is everything. If anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer them about anything to do with MySQL. Thank you. Anyone? Okay. I'll get you. You've had like three already. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on your needs. Um, for anything that I'm developing, I think about it straight away. Um, but if you're running your personal blog, right, it really depends on what your data needs. Um, uh, my previous job, we did uh, course catalogs uh, for colleges, which is actually uh, contractual data. So it always has to be correct. Doesn't matter how slow it is, it has to be correct. Um, so different challenges there than like performance type stuff. Yes. So taking into account how complicated is all of them? How complicated is all of them? Well, that's you're comparing apples to oranges, right? If you want my SQL and you want the features of disaster recovery and high availability and performance then you're going to have to jump through some hoops. The 5.6 stuff, I would say, in terms of actually working, as opposed to Percona, um, and giving you a fair amount of uh, stability and everything else, the GTID 5.6 stuff is the best way to go. Anyone else? Hey. Um, does the MariaDB fork of uh, MySQL, what version of that would you want to get the GTID stuff? Should be 5.6. Okay. Um, right now, if anyone's curious, Maria, Percona, and MySQL are feature parity. Um, there's not really much to differentiate them other than ideology. They, they don't? Okay, I mistake that. 
these, these are, uh, honestly, Oracle and MySQL, like, I know that there's sort of an ideology thing about it, but they really are the ones pushing things right now. Uh, that may change, especially with Maria being default in Ubuntu and other things, but for me, Oracle MySQL is still where it's at, and that's not because they are a stakeholder in engineering. Um, anyone else? <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Can I get your name?